And so today, we're under that same topic in, in John, just going through John, where the message today is, Call to Play Second Fiddle. That's what our message is entitled. Let's say a prayer. Uh, Jesus, show us now, work through a broken vessel. May the words of Jesus and your heart come through clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. So first thing we do, we read a passage of scripture. <clears throat> Moving along, John 3, 22 through 31. Let's go. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing in Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. And people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over uh, um, ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everyone is going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth, and we speak of earthly things. But he has come from heaven, and is, he and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Man, he, he, he gets on a little soapbox there, right? So, so the question that we have to answer as, we, as we're going through this, is, as we make some observations, again, feel free to text, um, text that number. We'll, we'll share them here as time permits. What's going on in the text? So in order to do that, right, because oftentimes we live in a society that we are so bombarded with stuff, whether it's advertisements or whatever, it's just boom, 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 boom. And it's so easy to go through life kind of paying attention, but not really because it's just so much. And if we take that same approach to God's word and saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to spend my time with you. And the kids are going and things are going crazy and, and your phones and notifications are going off. You just, you just miss it. So slow down. We read it again. And we look at the observations that we can make as we go to the same text again. So again, then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem. They went into the Judean countryside. And Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing near, at Anon near Salem because there was plenty of water there. And people kept coming to him for baptism. This is before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between or over... Between, a debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man that you, you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. And everyone, everybody, is going to him instead of coming to us. First thing I saw, <laughs> people don't always get along. You would think, what, what's going on here? Well, you would think that th this is all going for good. But no, 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 no. We've got some issues. And they come almost, almost frustrated. Like, hey, we, we were getting the shine. We were getting the, the, the good times. And everybody was coming to us. And now, now they're going to him. Ugh. Fix it, John. John replied, no one can give him anything unless God gives it from heaven. He says, you yourselves know how plainly I told you, I'm not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride. And the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I'm filled with, I'm filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. 
Man, as we read this, and, and maybe we've, we've, we've read this text before or, or are familiar with it, and, but, but you've got to put yourself in the situation, right? Many of us don't, will probably never have, or I don't want to say that, but we don't have the platform that John had. I mean, at this time, because again, there had been years and years and years of just silence. There had been no prophetic messages, nothing. And all of a sudden, here comes John, uh, a really interesting looking man by the way that he dressed, and, and he starts preaching, and boy... The crowds loved him, and, and they started flocking to him, and, and he, was, he, would be on, he would be on every single, he'd be on Twitter, he'd be on Facebook, he would be on social media, he would have been on CNN, Fox, everybody was coming to this new phenomenon. And, and as John is preaching this message, hey, hey listen, um, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and, and, and he's getting the shine, he's getting the glory, he's getting all this stuff, and of course he develops a little posse, right, some, some people who support him and are taking care of his needs, etc., and, and a time comes, and just imagine when this, little, this Judean carpenter man comes, and, and then John says, hey, behold, this is, this is the Messiah, and then he baptizes him, and, and then, and he leaves, and and it happened almost so quickly that the disciples of John were like, oh, that's cool. I'm not sure what that was about. Well, let's keep doing what we're doing. But, but a certain time comes now when Jesus starts to get more and more and, and less are going to John and his disciples. And John has no problem with it. But the disciples, they're starting to get a little concerned. I mean, it's okay if he gets a couple of people. But, but, but John, let's, let's be honest here. You know, we're going to start losing our profit share. And John's like, of what? I was given this assignment by God. I'm doing what I was asked to do. And his disciples were like, but, 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 but we're not going to be as, what, important? They didn't understand their role. They had trouble recognizing that God had elevated them in a position to serve. He has come from above and is greater than anyone else. And we are of the earth and we speak of earthly things. But he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few believe what he tells them. Anyone who accepts his testimony can affirm that God is true. For he is sent by God. He speaks God's words. For God gives the him the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has put everything into his hands. And anyone who believes in God's son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't Obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. Here's what I saw. John knew how to stay in his lane. He knew the path that was cut out for him. And although he got discouraged later, he was not going to veer from where God had put him. I tell you the truth. All, of all who have ever lived, this is later, Jesus' words about John. I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Yet, even the least of the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What kind of man would John have had to be for Jesus to say those words? Of everyone who has ever lived up until that point, no one was greater than John the Baptist. Those are, that is a high compliment coming from the highest king. How could he say that about John? Because John stayed in his lane. John got his assignment and fixed on it and focused on it and didn't allow prestige, praise, accolades to divert him from his purpose. So here we go with some applications, right? How can I apply this to my life? Well, huh. we saw that people don't always get along. We live in a world full of people. So, so the question is for us, how are my people skills? Do you get along with people? And I tell you what, <clears throat> it's really interesting. As, as I look at my, my primary role, especially it's really cool, um, as we were transitioning and, and building, building the, the new facility and, and going through the whole process. And, and I'm sitting down with, 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 with lawyers and, and attorneys and, and people that understand math and numbers and real estate numbers and da-da-da. And, and, and for a moment there, I was like, God, why am I in this room? 
I don't know nothing about real estate. I don't know anything about loans and finances. I don't know anything about this. But, but, but God said, well, Daniel, you're here just to love people. That's your primary role. I was like, well, that's interesting. Because, folks, as, it doesn't matter what industry that you work in. It's filled with people. And, and when people are involved, problems aren't always far behind. Because we have, we have ways that we think, and, and we're not bad people, so to speak, but we just have opinions. Any of you just know that you're opinionated? Yeah, come on. Put your, no? Okay. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Be, be, be proud. I mean, we know anyway, <laughs> right? But the challenge is, as people have one opinion, and they have another opinion, and then we don't like how people are talking to each other or talking to us, and then we get frustrated, and then we start blaming people and criticizing people, right? And Jesus is saying, no, hey, 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 hey. No, stop. And, and we're primarily put on this earth to be a witness to other people. And friends, if you don't like people or people don't like you, it's a problem. How do you minister to somebody when they don't like you? Can you see how that can be a little challenging? So, so God wants to know, how are your people skills? How do you interact well with others? Now, that doesn't mean, right, that people don't always, that people always make good choices. Or that people are always easy to get along with. Do you know, and don't, if they're here, don't look at them. Do you know some people who are difficult? To, can we just be real? There's some people, you might live with them, you might be one of them, just hard-headed people. So difficult. And you're like, why are you so hard to deal with? And I'm not hard to deal with. Oh my goodness. Right? But Jesus wants to know, your ability to witness is directly tied in your ability to get along with people. Now, that doesn't mean you become a people pleaser, but it does mean that you learn how to love people. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm learning that now, and, and, and as I parent, and, and as I go about doing things, I'm learning, okay, man, how, how can I, because I, I think I, I'm pretty good deal, dealing with people, but God is like, good, but pretty good, not good enough. He's not just interested in where you are. And if you're terrible, that's fine. But he's hoping to move you up. If you're good at people, that's fine. He wants to make you better. If you're great with people, good. Be even better. Because again, a relationship with Jesus is designed for us to become the best version of ourselves. He cleanses us. He fills us with his power. And we become the best version of ourselves to be able to serve others. So, so, so I'm reading this, this book. Uh, you, you may have read it. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Right? Uh, now, now be careful, don't, don't read the book to learn people skills, to learn how to manipulate people, because that's completely <laughs> not the point of it. But one of the things that he says uh, in the first chapter, he says, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. I'm like, oops, <laughs> did all three of those this morning, potentially, right? Um, John Wanamaker, he founded a couple stores, and he once confessed, listen, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence. <laughs> what is he saying? He's saying, man, some people just make dumb choices. But guess what? Who am I to criticize them? I have enough issues dealing with my own self. Right? Stay in your lane. And especially difficult when you're married because you, you think that the reason you got married is to make the other person holy. No, it's so that the other person <laughs> can help make you holy by you submitting to Jesus. So, so it's about learning to love others. The other, the other day, actually just, la just last night, right? I I'm, I'm a work in progress. We, we had some friends over and, and, uh, and as I'm learning to apply this, you know, don't criticize, complain. And, and I grew up in a culture where, you know, it's very heavy on do the right thing. You know, you better, if you misbehave now, you just wait till we get home, right? It's a little bit of that fear based. And not say that's all unhealthy, but there was a lot of, you know, criticizing, like, stop doing that, stand up straight. Da -da 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 -da. And so, unfortunately, I inherited some of that. And, and as Hadassah, and I don't know what she did, something silly. Um, and I corrected her. I'm like, Hadassah, don't do this right in front of everybody. And one thing I'm learning is like, don't correct your kids in front of everybody, take them to a side room. And deal with it there. And I'm like, anybody got time for that? Well, guess what? <laughs> then they, they get resentful. Because how do you like being made look silly in front of everybody? Not fun. Nobody likes that. Right? And they don't have an option because they're children. So it's, it's on us to be, okay, the mature parent. <laughs> the mature parent? Interesting. It's on us to, to, to be the adults in the situation and learn how to lovingly correct them. 
And so, because and, and, here's what happened. The moment I said, Hadassah, and it wasn't even like a, stop doing that. It was just like, Hada- oh, here's what it is. She was trying to pick up her sister, right? And <laughs> can you imagine a three-year-old trying to pick up a nine? And Hannah Marie is chunky, right? So she tried to lift her up. And I think as she set her down, she bumped her head. It wasn't a big bump, but I was like, Hadassah, do you see why I asked you not to pick her up? And she just <clears throat> automatically. Because what happens when you correct somebody in front of other people? Do you think they're like, thanks for the correction? No, no. They're, they're, they're frustrated. They don't like that. It doesn't make them look good. There was a better way to deal with that. So she gets frustrated in the corner. And of course, now I'm like, oh, now, now you want to act up? Well, if you really want... Well, we were, Liddy, thankfully, worked on that well. But I'm reading, this, I'm reading this book, and there's a poem. A poem called Father Forgets. Uh, and, and I'll read it. The, it says, Father Forgets. Listen, son, I'm saying this as you lie asleep. One paw crumpled up in your cheek. The blonde curls stickily wet on your damp forehead. I've stolen into your room alone just a few minutes ago as I sat reading my paper in the library. A stifling wave of remorse swept over me. Guiltily, I came to your bedside. See, son, these are the things that I was guilty, or these are the things that I was thinking, son. I had been cross to you. I scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave your face a mere dab with a towel. I, told, I took you to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called out angrily when you threw out something on the floor. At breakfast, I found fault too. You spilled things. You gulped your food. And you put your elbows on the table. You spread your butter too thick on your bread. And you started off to play. And I, as I made for my train, you turned and waved and said, Goodbye, Daddy. I frowned and I said in reply, hold your shoulders back. Then it all began over, all over again in the late afternoon. As I came up the road, I spied on you, down on your knees playing marbles. There were holes in your stockings. I humiliated you before your friends by marching ahead of you to the house. Stockings are expensive. And if you, you, had, and if you had to buy them, you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from a father. Do you remember later when I was reading in the library how you came in timidly with a sort of hurt look in your eyes? When I glanced over my paper, impatient at the interruption, you hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said nothing, but you ran across and in one tempestuous plunge, you threw your arms around my neck and kissed me. Your small arms tightened with affection that God had set blooming in your heart and which could neither neglect or could wither. Then you were gone, pattering up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly afterwards that my paper slipped from my hands and a terrible, sickening fear came over me. What habit had I gotten into? The habit of finding fault, of reprimanding. This was my reward to you for being a boy. It was not that I didn't love you. It was that I expected too much of youth. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. There was so much good and fine and true in your character. The little heart of yours was as big as the dawn itself over the wide hills. This was was shown by your spontaneous impulse to rush in and kiss me goodnight. Nothing else matters tonight, son. I've come to your bedside in the darkness, and I have knelt there ashamed. It's a feeble atonement. I know that you would not understand these things if I told them to you during your waking hours. But tomorrow, I'll be a real daddy. I'll chum with you and I'll suffer when you suffer. I'll laugh when you laugh. I'll bite my tongue when impatient words come. And I'll keep saying it as if it were a ritual. He's nothing but a boy. A little boy. I'm afraid I've visualized you as a man. Yet as I see you now, son, crumpled out and weary in your cot, I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday, you were in your mother's arms, your head on her shoulder. I have asked too much. Too much. That got to me. And I wonder if we could spend less time criticizing people. Not that they don't do some very wrong, idiotic, stupid things. Right? We're not saying that they don't do that. But by criticizing people, when have you ever gotten them to do better? It doesn't. It's simply an ineffective tool, yet one that we use over and over and over. So here's what we can do. Instead of criticizing, why don't you speak life into them? Why don't you find the good things that they are doing and praise those? And if you really don't have anything to say, that's good. Say nothing at all. Right? Second thing, 
we saw John knew how to stay in his lane. In military, t this Tim taught me this, um, that there, there are structures, right? in large organizations, there are structures on purpose. Why? Because structures and when people have certain uh, responsibilities, it helps them stay where they're supposed to stay. And, and what happens is when you start um, neglecting what you were assigned to and start focusing and worrying on other people's assignments, it's called mission creeping, right? mission creep. You got your marching orders, but you're all in this area and you shouldn't be. Stop mission creeping. And, and so the question is, what areas in your life are mission creeping? Right? When we, when we look at what God has asked you to do, maybe the role of a husband or a wife or a, a father, a, a son, a daughter, an aunt, a worker, a sister, a brother. What areas in your life are mission creeping? In other words, what are you doing that God has not asked you to do that's getting out of the sphere of what he has thought or asked you to do? A couple things came into my mind, four things, areas that my, happen in mission creep. My thought life, right? What are the things that I think about? What are the things that constantly go through my head? And if you're anything like me, the truth is, um, if you're not directly taking care of a task, we tend to be thinking about ourselves. And sometimes when we think about ourselves, it's easy to think about what's going wrong. You know, like, oh, I messed that up again. Oh, I'm not making enough money. Oh, man, when am I going to get this? And oh, I can't believe I did this, right? But the Bible says, Philippians 4, 8, Finally, beloved, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellence, and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about such things. Let's change our minds to think about things that will glorify God and glorify each other. Second area that I, that I realized, oh, um, the words that come out of my mouth. Oh, yeah, that's, that's tough. Right? We do some mission creep on that. We, we say things about people. And in our minds, it's completely justified, right? When, when your coworker completely blows the account, you're just like, oh my goodness, she did it again. She's just a moron. But of course, you never say things like that, right? We just think them, <laughs> right? Or we say, how, how can she do this? Or our bosses, it's, all, oh, it's always easy to talk about those in leadership, right? Those responsible for us or our areas and, and about how they should be, could be doing a better job than they're doing. Can you believe it? How can they do that again? Oh my goodness, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. How, how are they in that position? What does Jesus say? The tongue can bring death and life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So instead, God says, do this. Pray in the spirit at all times and at every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. God is saying, oh, please, please resist the urge to criticize others. Trust me, it's there. And it even might be justified. It's just not helpful and building up in their character. Somebody asked, hey, uh, is constructive criticism negative to Christ's mission in our lives? No, no, that's a good point. Nothing wrong with constructive criticism. But here's what I've learned. Unless I have built a relationship and earned the right to speak in someone's life, Keep your criticism to yourself. Because here's the deal, right? If I've got something to say that can help you, and if I really wanted to help you, first I'd get to know you, right? Because most often than not, the people that we criticize are people that we see all the time. So if it's a coworker and you, you, there's something wrong with them or how they're doing something, first find out about them. Be genuine. And as you find out more about other people, guess what you realize? Oh, wow. If I were in their position, knowing what they know, I probably would have done the same thing. It's too easy for us to think that we're better than others. Then, then you actually take a look in their lives and say, well, you, it's easy to criticize, you know, parents and, like, you know, oh my goodness, these kids. And what do their parents do? Or maybe the single parent, like, oh my goodness, why can't you do this? And it's like, wait, first of all, are you a single parent? No, shut your mouth. You, you have no idea what it looks like to raise a kid by yourself or kids, children. So before you open your mouth about how they should do this, and how, why don't you say, how can I help? Hey, can I give your kids a ride home? I'm going the same direction. Because when, when you earn the right to speak in people's lives, invest in them first, then, and only then, let them know how they can fix something, right? Because I'm much more apt to change once I know someone cares about me than, uh, here's where you need to fix your pastoring skills. You know, that sermon, and here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying 
that it's not okay to share an opinion, right? But, but sometimes people will come to me and say, you know, pastor, da, 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 da. And, and sometimes I'm like, when's the last time you preached? Right? Or when's the last time you had my job? I'm not saying I'm not able to, and I'm, I'm big enough where I'm able to handle that. But the challenge is like, man, what would really be helpful is if you came and just affirmed some, affirmed me. Not me, me, me specifically, but people. Say, hey man, I appreciate your message. Hey, I had one thought as your message. You said this. What did that mean? Here's how I saw that perspective. Comes a lot different than, you know, you, you ought to, because uh, if I'm not in my right mind, I'll tell you what you ought to do <laughs> and where you ought to take your opinions, right? We're human. We're fragile. We have egos. The Lord's working on them, but they're still probably bigger than they should be. So he says, listen, let me help you deflate that. Hey, you really don't want to listen? Get married. <laughs> That'll pop your ego. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> another area that mission creep. Um, trying to make others change. Oh, anyone else struggle with this one? Like I work with people, and they're incompetent, and I need to make them competent. <laughs> Good luck with that. <clears throat> this is what John says. But in fact, <clears throat> it's best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, won't come. And if I do go away, then I will send him to you. <clears throat> Watch what he's going to do. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. Translation, it is the job and the role of the Holy Spirit to convict people of sin. That's not your job. It's not your job to point out everybody else's sin in their life. Not your job. Your job is to love people, to care for them, to invest in them. Very different from when I have a vested relationship with you and you know that I care about you, then I could say, hey, bro, what? let's talk, man. What is going on? You're, wh why are you, come on, why are you living with this girl? You're not married. What's going on there? But, 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 if you just happen, if you happen to go to the same church and you're like, hey, I heard you're living with this so-and-so and you need to stop. I'd be like, okay, first of all, none of your business, what I do, none of your business. Secondly, you don't know me like that. And who do you, who are you? Because here's what happens. Then I go in defensive. If I don't know that you care about me and you love me and you start pointing fingers about my life, what am I going to do? Oh, so you're God's gift on earth to point out sin of everyone? Look at how you did this and, and look at how you do that, right? Because then you start blaming each other. And then how productive is that? Again, I get the intention. We want people to live up to what God's standard for them is. But here's the deal. You have enough in your own life trying to get right with the Lord. So stay there. Love people, serve them, and when you have earned the right to speak into their life, lovingly take them aside and say, let's have a conversation. One of the things about Pastor Egan, I'll be honest, that irritated me when I first got to know him, is he just, he's not rushed for time. And it was a little irritating, because here I am, this, this hippie go, let's go, 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 let's, let's achieve. What's the problems? Let's fix them. People, we'll, fi we'll tell them what to do, and then they'll do it. I meet Pastor Egan and says, how are you? I'm like, I'm trying to fix stuff. He's like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, and you should be too, right? I don't know. He's learned. Fix people? No, not our job. Love people. Serve people. Yes. And as you earn the right to speak into their lives, then you come and say, hey, I see that's going on. Let's talk about that. Because my guard's not up. It's down. And I'm ready to say, yeah, I'm struggling. Because when people do stuff, there's a reason they do stuff. And often, it's not the reason you think that they do stuff. It's a different reason. But you won't find out the reason unless you get their guard down and then ask them. And then they might tell you. They don't, know how, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So when I speak with Pastor Egan, I've learned now. He shows up, put aside your agenda. Because it's connect. I like, how's good? Oh, life's good. How's that? Okay, good. How's life really going? Oh, okay. You really care about me to take time to invest in me. The fourth area that's easy to mission creep, at least in my world, is time spent in God's word, right? And it's not that you, 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 you don't spend time, because you know, I, hope, I, hope, I hope some of us in here spend time with Jesus on a consistent basis. But, but the challenge is sometimes that we, we do our devotion like it's something to check off. Like, did you have your devotion time? Check! And then we leave. But the problem is we need Jesus all day long, not just when we check off our devotion. So 
the Bible says, study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it night and day so that you'll be able to do everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. But they delight in the law of the Lord and they meditate on it day and night. So here's what I was able to do. Okay, how can I get that going? I, I got some headphones. And as I go throughout my day, I'm listening to God's word. Because I know it's not just I need them in the morning. No, no, I need them in the morning. I need them during the day. I need them even when I'm sleeping. <laughs> so be more intentional about, you know, getting more time with God. Someone said once the solution to pollution is dilution. I was like, what? If, if you take a little vial of arsenic, right, and if you just drink it, it'll kill you. Or put it in a glass of water, it'll kill you. But if you put it in an Olympic-sized swimming pool, it's not going to kill you. Why? Because there's so much water, it'll basically <clears throat> dilute that poisonous vial. So what's the solution to the problem in our head, the way we think we're trying to get other, everybody to change and we want them to do what we want them to do and, and we want to be in control? You know what the solution to that is? Dilute what's going on in your mind with God's word. Put more of it in and so it will take the garbage out of your life. And slowly but surely, your thoughts change, your emotions change, your motives change. So we say, okay, what's, what's my response to God's word? Thank you for being big enough to run the universe. And I desperately need your help to focus on my mission and to let you handle the results. John was called to play second fiddle. He was not the main show. He was just the opening act. What about in your life? Do we sometimes become confused and think that we're the main act? Or do we recognize that we are only here to open for the main act, which is Jesus. Parents, are you okay if the greatest investment or the greatest purpose in your life is to invest in your children? Or are you so bent on them being what you want them to be that you forget that that's not your role? To correct, yes. To encourage, yes. To instruct, yes. But to plug them into God so at some point God can help them make these choices. Yes, with counsel, if you have your mind right. Because of his relationship with God, John was willing to play his role and let Jesus play his role without interference. That was John's greatest characteristic. What about us, friends? What about us? I want to encourage us, no matter where you are in your life, God loves us. And he knows we've got a lot of stuff to work on. That's why I sent Jesus. And when Jesus left, he said, hey, listen, I know all y'all need me, and I can't be everywhere at once. At least I've chosen not to be because of this human body that I've taken. But I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he will convict you of sin. He will lead you into all truth. Are we willing to let Jesus day by day do that? It doesn't happen overnight. It's a work of a lifetime. At 5 o'clock today, we'll be praying together. Last time that we'll meet at 5, starting next Saturday, it'll be 8 o'clock, 8.30 in the morning. But God wants to speak to us. He wants to use us. There are some hard truths that our world needs to hear. Jesus is coming again. And it's not always going to be comfortable. There are some difficult things. Someone said this once, and I love it. They said, our job is to build bridges of grace Amen. strong enough to handle the weight of truth. Because there's some heavy truth about what God wants to do with us, about how he wants to cleanse this world, about what we should be eating and drinking and, and when and how we should be worshiping. And, and the only thing that God wants to change is everything. But he's not going to do it all at once. It's too concentrated. We wouldn't be able to hear it. So how does he do it? He sends people who can love people enough to gently lead them into the ways of truth. Before you tell me about a health message and eating tofu, you, I better know that you love me. Before you tell me about a Sabbath and all this stuff, and, and before you tell me about the beasts and the horns, and they're there, and it's all good, right, in its proper context, but I have to know that you care. And then you need to be willing to give me the space to let the Holy Spirit work on me. Because God knows 
that you weren't always easy to work with and still might not be, but he works with us anyways, right? So let's extend the same grace that he gave to us. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, thank you for the example of John. If we were in his position, what would we have done? Thankfully, we're not. But we are where we need to be. Show us how to love people and show us how to be intentional about staying in our lane and leaving the results up to you. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for never giving up on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. It meant a lot to us. We know that God's got a blessing for you as you apply what he's taught you throughout the week. Have an amazing week, and don't forget to tune in next Sabbath. Have a good one.